Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so very much for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Jama Best, and I'm the executive director of the Arkansas Humanities Council. And uh, this is a first in a series of lectures on the U.S. Constitution. And we are very honored to have such distinguished guests tonight to visit with us uh, about the Constitution. And uh, I think you will all truly enjoy uh, the conversation. Uh, with Dean Biner and uh, Skip Rutherford. And um, so now I would like to introduce to you our distinguished guest. Um, this evening we have joining us Dean Teresa Biner. Uh, she is the first permanent uh, female Dean at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock Bowen School of Law. Uh, during her first three years as Dean, she helped fund and start the law school's Veterans Legal Services Clinic and Pro Bono Services Center, as well as successfully sought approval and funding for the Center for Racial Justice and Criminal Justice Reform at the school. Dean Biner has served as the law school's Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Associate Dean for Faculty Development. A graduate of the University of Virginia and the Northwestern University Pritzker School of Law, Dean Biner teaches and researches in the areas of employment discrimination, diversity in the judiciary, constitutional law, and civil procedure. Uh, Bowen School of Law has awarded Dean Biner its Faculty Excellence Awards for scholarship and teaching. Thank you for joining us this evening, Dean Biner. Um, now I'd like to introduce to you our other distinguished guest, uh, Skip Rutherford. Uh, Skip Rutherford of the, was for the retired Dean of the University of Arkansas Clinton School of Public Service, uh, which opened in 2005 and uh, was the first school of its kind in the world that offered master's degrees in public service and has an emphasis and also has an emphasis on project project based learning. A graduate of the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville, uh, he received the journalism department's first distinguished alumnus award. He has an extensive private sector background in communications and public relations and has served as the visiting professor of the University of Arkansas, Lyon College in Batesville, the University of the Ozarks in Clarksville, and the University of Central Arkansas in Conway. And he was awarded Honorary Doctor of Humane Letters degree from the Hendricks College in Conway, Arkansas. Skip is, uh, or Dean Rutherford is also a former administrative assistant to the United States Senator David Pryor and has been active in numerous campaigns and initiatives uh, at the local, state, and federal levels. He is the founder or an organizer of the Political Animals Club, a nonpartisan grassroots organization of community leaders and activists who meet regularly to discuss politics and issues of the day. Uh, Dean Rutherford serves on the Board of Trustees at Lyon College, the Health Policy Board for the Arkansas Center for Health Improvement, and the Board of Directors of the Arkansas Children's Incorporated, where he has promoted statewide children's health advocacy. He also served as the first president of the advisory board for the Arkansas School for Mathematics, Sciences, and Arts, and is a past president of the Little Rock School Board. He has received numerous awards uh, throughout his long uh, distinguished career. And so without further ado, I'd like to now introduce you Dean Biner and uh, Skip Rutherford. Thank you both for joining us. We're looking forward to this. Thank you. Thank you, Gemma, for that nice uh, introduction. I appreciate all of you being here tonight to join us to talk a little bit about the Constitution. I'm especially happy to see some familiar faces out there. Hi there, Connor. Hi, Janice. Kristen, thank you for joining us this evening. So I'm going to start just by talking a little bit about the foundations of the Constitution, where it comes from, and what it's designed to do. Uh, you, probably many of you know that this is not our first Constitution. Our first Constitution was actually the Articles of Confederation, uh, which were ratified in 1781. Uh, they created a very weak federal government, essentially only Congress, um, and left the states really to their own sovereignty. 
uh, this government did not prove very useful as a general matter. Uh, Congress couldn't levy taxes, it couldn't really handle international trade, and there was all kinds of international trade disputes that really required a strong federal government. And so we went back to the drawing board and had a new constitutional convention in 1787, which resulted in our first con our, our current constitution. So it didn't take too long for them to decide that first one didn't work too well. Our current constitution, as I noted, was written in 1787 and then eventually ratified by state conventions in 1787 and 1788. This makes it, by the way, one of the oldest continuously used constitutions in the world. We have the second oldest, um, and I'm sure nobody knows what the oldest constitution that's currently being in use is because it's from the tiny country of San Marino. Uh, so we have a very old um, and enduring constitution by modern standards. This constitution is very different from our first articles. Obviously, it sets up the executive, legislative, and judicial branches, but it does more than that. Um, where the Articles of Confederation emanated from the states, it was a, basically a states compact, this consti our constitution emanates directly from the people, and that's important. Uh, if you look, you probably many of you know that the preamble um, starts with, we the people of the United States. So it's the people who are directly creating our constitution and giving it the authority it has, not the states. That was a definitely different theory of how a country should be um, run than by, by a series of different states joining together. It was also set up to be, a the federal government was set up to be a government of limited power. Um, there was disagreements between groups, uh, the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. As you might expect, the Federalists believe that there should be a strong federal government. People like Alexander Hamilton and John Adams were in that camp. And then the Anti-Federalists were people who wanted the states to remain the stronger governments and the federal government to remain weaker. People like George Mason, Patrick Henry were in that group. Um, and so they set up a federal government of limited powers. Um, and of course, three branches. It's really important to understand that Article I sets up the legislative branch and it's the first article of the constitution. Uh, it was thought the legislature was the most important because it would be directly answerable to the people, be directly, directly elected by the people. So it comes in first. Uh, section eight of Article I sets out some limited powers of Congress, um, some of which that have gotten larger over time, specifically the commerce power has gotten larger over time, but Nonetheless, it's supposed to be a legislature that has limited power and that the states are going to be doing much of the legislating and regulating of everyday citizens' lives. The executive branch was set out in Article II, so that's where the president um, is, is set out. Uh, he has powers to execute whatever the legislature sets up and enacts. He also has some, inherent, has some designated powers as commander-in-chief, uh, negotiating treaties, um, appointing uh, Supreme Court and other officials, again, with vice and consent of the Senate, and he has the, the pardon power. So we often see uh, at the very last end of presidencies that they're pardoning people. And finally, last but not least in Article Three is the judicial power. Um, the federal judges are different than our state judges. Federal judges are, are appointed for life and have guaranteed salaries. So nice job if you can get it. You can stay as long as you want. And that explains why we have Supreme Court justices in their 80s. Um, they can stay as long as they want to until they feel like retiring. Uh, this was a, there was also a compromise when, we, when the, the uh, Constitution was first drafted. It only sets up the United States Supreme Court. It leaves for another day whether there will be lower federal courts um, that will actually try cases or be a, at the appellate level. It was thought at the beginning that it would be states that would be the trial courts and would be handling much of the judicial business. And only the Supreme Court would be um, relied on to, for, to interpret federal law when it needed to. Of course, now we've got uh, many federal trial courts. We have uh, federal court, courts of appeals to hear appeals from those federal trial courts. So uh, Congress did enact a very vast uh, federal judicial system eventually. Um, but at first there was this compromise that only created the United States Supreme Court. Um, so that's how our government is structured, but what about our rights? Um, well, the Bill of Rights doesn't come in uh, come into later. Um, it was first thought that we really didn't need a Bill of Rights because the federal government was so limited in its authority, it couldn't overreach. Uh, but event, and that, by the way, uh, was I mean, James Madison was one of the believers who thought, eh, we don't we don't really need a Bill of Rights. However, there were others that were worried about not having some designated rights uh, that were specific in the Constitution. Um, and eventually Madison authored the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, after some urging by Thomas Jefferson, who at the time was actually in Paris acting as a trade minister for the United States. Um, still, there were people who 
thought if we have a bill of rights that designates only certain rights, well, is that going to limit us? Aren't there going to be more rights out there? So there was some concern by designating specific rights that it would eliminate other rights that they felt should be available to the people. Um, eventually, Madison does draft the, the Bill of Rights. He introduces it in Congress in 1789, and it ends up being ratified in 1791, so several years after the initial ratification of the Constitution. And it includes many of the rights that we're very familiar with, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, uh, the right to due process of law, um, a habeas corpus, uh, just to name a few of the rights that are in there, right against uh, search and seizures, a lot of things that we know about. But Madison, to, come to assuage those who thought, wait a minute, if we designate a bunch of rights, are we gonna eliminate other ones that are out there that we'd like to recognize? Also throw in the Ninth Amendment, uh, which states that the enumeration um, in the constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage other, others retained by the people. So they acknowledge there's other rights out there besides these. We're just specifying these in terms of protecting you from this big federal government. He also included the 10th Amendment, which has become controversial, a bit controversial modernly. Uh, that states that the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it, to the, by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Again, a, a broad grant of rights to the people. What those rights might be, we'll see. <laughs> we'll have to wait and see. Um, so that's how we're basically set up. We have this basic uh, structure of what the authority is of the legislative, executive, and judicial branches within their spheres. And then we have these 10 rights. Of course, the constitution has been amended many times since then. We have obviously women now have the right to vote. They did not originally. Uh, we've had, uh, we had prohibition, we had prohibition taken away. We've had a bunch, of, a bunch of other amendments that have come after that, but that's the basic structure of the government. Um, it sets out the, the powers of the, the free branches and then has the Bill of Rights that limits those rights, limits the authority of those three, bran those three branches. When I'm teaching constitutional law, and it's one of the courses I teach here at the law school, I always tell students to ask two questions. One, does the federal, a, the federal entity have the authority to do it? And if you answer that question, yes, by looking at that first part of the Constitution, then ask yourself, is there something in the Bill of Rights that limits their authority or something in another amendment that might limit their authority to do what they're doing? Uh, so there's sort of a two-part two question anytime you're doing a basic constitutional analysis. So that's it. That's the basics of the Constitution. Um, Skip's going to bring in some things that might be more relevant for us here in Arkansas. Well, well Dean Byner, thank you. That was... Uh... That's a great lesson. I hope they recorded it. That would be perfect for every civics class in Arkansas. I'm a little intimidated that Connor is on the call. So um, bear with me because uh, he knows more about this stuff than I do. The, uh, the thing that's most interesting to me about the constitution is that, that there have been only, I believe, 17 amendments in 230 years. And this is where the politics of the Constitution gets into play, uh, because a couple of hundred uh, amendments are offered in every congressional session. And having worked for a senator, you see these being tossed out there. But, but since 1791, there's only been 17 additional ones that have been adopted. Um, and I think it's important to realize that uh, I used to remember that Senator Dale Bumpers used to carry around a copy of the Constitution in his coat pocket. He, he, he wanted to have a copy of the Constitution with him the whole time so that in an argument and debate, he could pull out his Constitution and quote it and, and cite it. But while we think of the Constitution as a legal document, and it is, I think we also have to view it in the sense that there's a lot of politics that go into the Constitution. And we saw that with prohibition and re repeal of prohibition. We saw that with the Equal Rights Amendment, uh, which I'd like for you to sort of get into. Um, but but the, when I think of the Constitution and I look at it from a practical viewpoint, now admittedly, a little prejudice here, being a former president of the Little Rock School Board. But I look at Cooper v. Aaron, or Aaron v. Cooper and Brown v. Board, and the fact that not since the Civil War had the federal government sent troops to the South. 
to maintain the law of the land. And so the way Arkansas reacted pre-Central High Crisis and the way Arkansas has reacted post-Central High Crisis in terms of constitutional issues is to me of enormous interest. So a lot of, obviously, uh, you know, I didn't mention the, the three big amendments that come as a result of, of the Civil War, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. But um, when you think back to the original Constitution, the Federalist versus Anti-Federalist, where we're, we're really keeping the states having a lot of authority, that all shifts, obviously, post-Civil War, uh, where we suddenly don't trust the states um, to do, do right, quite frankly, and we need the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments um, to give actually Congress a, in some authority to make sure that um, the rights of newly freed slaves are actually maintained. So we have this shift um, after the Civil War, obviously, where we are less likely, we, we actually create rights vis-a-vis -vis the states for the, for the people, um, guaranteed the right to equal protection for people vis-a-vis -vis the states, the right to due process vis-a-vis -vis the states, and explicitly give Congress the authority to step in where they think that the states are running roughshod over people's rights. So we see a distinct shift post-Civil War, um, and that holds us together. Um, you know, that's part of what keeps us, obviously it took a war, a very terrible, you know, a war to, to get us to that point, but those amendments end up keeping the, the union together um, and keeping us going as, as a single constitution. Um, so here in Arkansas, of course, we've had some really interesting cases. Cooper versus Aaron, of course, is the Little Rock Central High case. And Skip's right, um, created a real potential for a constitutional crisis uh, when you have public officials who do not abide by a court, a court ruling. Um, and is probably one of that case, um, which went to the United States Supreme Court, is probably the most modern statement by the Supreme Court of its authority. Uh, it, it, it was a case where in no uncertain terms, the Supreme Court asserted that public officials do not have the right to overlook a court order, um, that they have to abide by the rule of law and they have to obey uh, what a court says. And of course, they needed, they needed troops in order to, at the end of the day, to enforce the order. And, and those of you who know that history know that it, it, took, uh, it took some doing um, by Thurgood Marshall with the pre at talking to the president at the time to actually get, get him to go ahead and, and bring troops in to make sure that those students could attend school pursuant to that court order. Um, you know, the, the authority of the court to issue pronouncements and, and final interpretations of what the constitution means, you know, dates way back to um, Marbury versus Madison. You know, if Connor will know that case, it's one of the first cases you read in constitutional law uh, where um, John Marshall, who was the chief justice at the time said, no, we get the final say about what the constitution says. Um, and you all have to listen to us when we say so. Uh, you know, that's, that's part of the beauty of the federal judiciary not being an elected branch. Um, they are, as you know, you know, as I pointed out, they are appointed uh, by the president with the vice and, and, and consent of the Senate. And the theory is that they are above the political fray and can go ahead and make determinations that politicians could not make um, because they'd be worried about being reelected. So uh, in the case of, of Cooper versus Aaron, you know, the court basically said, no, uh, what we say goes. And you public officials um, are not, in fact, I can, I can give you a, a quote, um, as they said in that case, uh, the constitutional rights of children not to be discriminated against in school admissions on grounds of race or color declared by this court in the Brown case can neither be nullified openly and directly by state legislators or state executive or judicial officers, nor nullified indirectly by them through evasive schemes for segregation, whether attempted ingeniously or uh, or geniusly, okay? They were in no uncertain terms, you can you have to abide by this court order. Um, you know, one of the things that, that's interesting about the, that case is it was a unanimous decision by the court, uh, a per curiam decision, which means there was no ex explicit author. The court spoke as a unified voice when it issued that decision. And again, in no uncertain terms. Um, so of course that, that put Little Rock on the map for many people nationally. Um, uh, the, the Central High Crisis was one of the first civil rights crises that was televised. So a lot of people saw what happened on TV. Um, it's a very visual crisis for a lot of people. 
So it is, it is, um, it's a very interesting, um, it's, a, it's a very, it's a very interesting from a historical standpoint, but also from a court, the court's assertion of authority in that case. You know, Dean Bonner, the interesting thing about the federal constitution in the Little Rock case, sometimes we tend to overlook what happens at the state constitutional level. Mm -hmm. and, and in 1956, Arkansas voters by a margin of 56% to 44% passed Amendment 44, which basically says, use everything you can within the realm of the law to thwart Brown v. Mm -hmm. Board. Mm -hmm. And it, it was an overwhelming election. That law remained on the books until 1990. That mm -hmm. law remained, that, that Amendment 44 was a part of the Arkansas Constitution until 1990. And uh, it and there was a a, a, a repeal vote uh, in 1990, and here's here, here's the vote total for for repeal. This is 1990, some 34 years later. For repeal, 273,527 against repeal, 263,261. Wow, we repealed. Uh, something by a 51 to 49 vote that 34 years later, you look back and say, you know, did, are, we pay, are we paying attention to the federal constitution here? Mm -hmm. um, and the Arkansas voters, I mean, we almost didn't repeal that. Mm -hmm. And the 24th amendment, which repealed the poll tax, Arkansas was one of the states that didn't ratify that oh. amendment. Oh. Arkansas didn't write that. Arkansas did replace the poll tax with a voter registration system, but it never ever uh, voted to, to repeal the poll tax. So when you look, when you do the history of the 24th Amendment, mm -hmm. you'll see Arkansas is one of the states that just did not sign on. Mm -hmm. So we have some resistance at the state level. Of course, um, you know, the, of course, you know, the, the Constitution is supreme. There's a supremacy clause in it. And where it applies, it is the supreme law of the land. So any state efforts to thwart what are uh, what is dictated by the Constitution is not going to work in the long run. Obviously, if it was brought to a court, you know, it would not be upheld. But uh, it's interesting that those those sort of moments are those those laws still sit on the books um, this many years later. Let, let me ask you a question um, that because we're headed into a constitutional test of this issue right now. And that is um, the, the issue of does OSHA have the right to mandate vaccines and or testing for companies of 100 or more, I think that's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is the, the current case. Um, we just saw that the Fifth Circuit uh, issued a stay of the president of OSHA's order to go to actually have its emergency order to require vaccinations, or you could do weekly testing and wear masks instead. It gave, it gave people those options and for employers of 100 or more. So uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, but it, it is an entity of the executive branch that basically um, sets up for employers standards um, that they're supposed to have in their workplaces. Um, and they and they protect, basically they're employee protections because we went through a long period of time where employees didn't have many more protections and they could get hurt on the job and not be able to work again. And it was like, sorry, uh, you so bad, sorry, you work in a dangerous workplace. We don't care. And uh, you can go ahead and survive any way you can. But uh, OSHA was put into place le by legislation from Congress um, to basically make sure that uh, workplaces were safe for employees. And uh, OSHA has some emergency authority from, from Congress. Um, they have what is called, um, uh, what's, what's the exact term? Oh, they have a, an emergency, they can set an emergency temporary standard um, in, si in situations where uh, it, it's necessary because something, there's a, a, an emergency going on at that time. So normally they go through a whole rulemaking process um, that takes a little more time before they adopt the standard. Uh, but they do have some emergency authority. 
So they, this is part of their emergency authority that they at least were exercising here, requiring these vaccinations. Um, and so uh, what happened is uh, there was a challenge to whether this was within their legislative authority to issue an emergency uh, order. And the Fifth Circuit, um, at least preliminarily, has decided that they think it wasn't um, and have issued a stay in this case. So this is about executive authority um, and whether Congress has given the executive branch, in this case through OSHA, the authority to issue a, an emergency uh, order in, this, in a situation like this. So it, it's, it's gonna be interesting to see what happens. Uh, one of the arguments in the long run, because it's gonna get fully litigated, um, but it, it, one of the arguments here was that, well, how can it be emergency when we're you know, two years into this now? Um, but I think it's, it's probably pretty clear just because an emergency hasn't been addressed yet, that it's still an emergency, okay? So when you still have people uh, getting uh, uh, ill during a pandemic um, and we don't seem to have it under total control, again, we, we see our numbers going up here in Arkansas yet again, uh, that there is a, a fair argument that the emergency obviously has not been fully evaded. Um, but right now the Fifth Circuit is, uh, has, has issued that stay and it'll, it'll be more fully litigated down the road. They didn't address any direct constitutional arguments in this case yet. They really looked at it as did Congress give the executive branch the authority to issue an emergency order um, in this kind of context. Uh, they did hint at some constitutional issues, um, but all it, it would be uh, the constitutional statements they made in the Fifth Circuit's decision were really what we would call dicta. Um, they didn't, it wasn't the basis for the ruling, um, but they did opine that they thought, uh, one of the things I thought was interesting that this might be a violation of the Commerce Clause. I'm relying on um, the Affordable Care Act line of cases that you, since they couldn't force people to, um, uh, the individual mandate to buy health insurance, uh, they can't force individuals to take a vaccine. But I think that's problematic here uh, for them. I mean, the, it was only dicta. They weren't, they were just opining on the side here in this case. But it seems to me there's a real difference between uh, regulating employers versus regulating individuals. Um, and certainly Congress has within its commerce power, the ability to regulate individuals. Um, I mean, excuse me, re regulate employers um, because they are obviously part of, of commerce. Uh, anybody who's in business is gonna be a part of, of commerce authority there. Um, if, if the logic of that would have basically um, could arguably argue against basically making making employees fill out I nine I nine forms uh, if you we don't want to submit our our immigration status information it's a personal it's our personal right not to I mean so you can extend this argument and certainly you you know employers can make sure that somebody that 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 the federal government can make sure that people are actually. Um, uh, uh, folks who can work in this country um, based on immigration laws. Uh, but the logic of their commerce analysis is really kind of interesting here if extended out to other situations. So, you know, one of the interesting things about the pandemic, and there's not a lot that I would say is good about the pandemic, um, mm -hmm. though I think it's changed our work style forever. I think hybrid and remote are probably going to be the very common from this point on. But one of the things that's really interesting in the Edinburg Policy Center uh, does, a, does a survey on every, around every Constitution Day, September 17th. They do a survey mm -hmm. uh, and they ask people questions about the Constitution. And one of the, the, the pandemic and the protest, and I'm addressing my buddy Connor here, the pandemic and the protest. Uh, raised uh, a lot of awareness about the United States Constitution, mm -hmm. particularly uh, uh, in 76% of the respondents were aware of freedom of speech as part of the First Amendment. Oh. That's the highest rating that has been recorded since the, the survey started happening. Mm -hmm. And part of that is because people participated or they watched on television or they were out there uh, supporting family and friends and providing legal guidance for people. But um, it became a great awareness of these issues. Freedom of religion bumped up to 56%. The highest number, I think, Dean Bonner, of people being able to recognize 
and name all three branches of government that you laid out, you know, the executive, legislative, judicial, uh, was, was almost at 40%. Mm -hmm. And those numbers have been extremely low. So what I think, I think, I think we got a good civics lesson in the, in the middle of, of, of a pandemic. And mm -hmm. uh, again, not trying to say it, it was, you know, the way to get a civics lesson, but I think we got one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's been uh, several, you know, significant events that have really raised people's awareness and made people um, much more politically aware, whether, you know, I, I think, you know, the immigration crisis um, at our borders, um, some of the policies about um, children being separated from their, from their parents at the borders, I think really got people engaged in what's going on in our government and who has authority to do what. And then, of course, we had, you know, um, the death of George Floyd, which really, I think, raised awareness about um, race, uh, racial discrimination and um, in, the, in the country. And people are, you know, I, I, I'm hearing more and more that this Generation Z is a very politically aware generation as well. Uh, Connor, I don't know if you're, you're a Gen Z or not. I know I, 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 no, no, okay. I have two Gen Zers in my family and, um, you know, they're definitely politically aware. Uh, and I, my, my, my youngest son, who's 21 and a music performance major, texts me about Supreme Court decisions all the time. I was like, hmm, this is interesting. Music majors are paying attention to what the Supreme Court's doing. So I think we have a very politically aware generation coming up as well. Um, so I think it, it, there's, there's just been a heightened awareness of a lot of things that I think are making people more engaged, um, which is a good thing. Um, I know we had a couple questions uh, in chat. I'm just going to do you mind if I take one of them, Skip? No, go ahead, sure. So, uh, Hygienis is asking about the right to bear arms, if it's been misinterpreted. Uh, he said, asked the situation then was malicious, we're to be armed to defend the colony. Is it not being misused by gun-loving people? <laughs> okay. Um, so this is, this is the anti, you know, this is the gun control argument um, that the Second Amendment is indeed uh, only really designed to uh, have a militia uh, one of the interesting facts about the Constitution is it does not um, actually create a standing army. It creates a standing navy because we had to protect our borders, uh, but it doesn't create a standing army. Um, instead, it really has Congress uh, declaring war and calling up an army. So people had, to, you know, the idea that you actually needed a militia because if you needed to defend yourself, you needed to call up an army. You know, that's not uh, an unlikely interpretation of the Second Amendment. Um, so many people who uh, are in favor of gun control make the argument that it doesn't extend to AK-47s. You can't, even from an, an originalist perspective, we're talking about muskets. Um, they couldn't have anticipated uh, the kinds of guns and weaponry that are, are here today. Um, and it really wasn't designed for the, purpose, for, for the purposes of bearing those types of arms. So that is a common argument that is made. Um, you know, it, What's interesting, I think one of the things, you know, that's always debatable in the Constitution is how much does it change based on changing times? Um, there's a real fissure among people who look at the Constitution. There's the originalists who want to look at it as originally written, and there's people who want it to morph as time and our understanding of, of, of you know, human nature, as well as, um, you know, just we fly around the country now, they, they were all on horses, you know, things have changed considerably and how do we adjust the constitution so that it endures? Um, and I think, you know, the court has, you know, changed things. It has adapted uh, in many instances to modern times. And I don't think it would have endured if they had it. Um, I think they had to make some of these adjustments it was also written in really broad terms so that it could be a bit malleable and subject to later interpretation. So um, yeah, hygiene is a good question. Um, and, and you're right, there's many people who believe that um, there isn't a very, as broad a constitutional right to bear arms as is um, sometimes argued among uh, folks in the public sphere. Yeah, but let's be realistic about it. The Supreme Court is not going to, uh, Supreme Court is not gonna limit the Second Amendment. Well, actually, you know, Skip, it's a pretty modernly acknowledged right, <laughs> quite frankly, it's in there, but it's only recently that it's been acknowledged as, a, as an individual right. Um, and in the, the case that they did it, it was basically a right to protect yourself in your home. Um, so how far they will extend that right beyond that, I think is an interesting question. 
So Connor's asking, speaking of the state constitution, I understand there were failed attempts to enact the new Arkansas constitution throughout the late 20th century. Skip, you might know stuff about this. Are we likely to ever see momentum around a state constitution, constitutional convention again? Skip, thoughts on that? Well, uh, we did have a constitutional convention, Connor, you're right. Uh, and several people that uh, uh, we all uh, know were very much involved with that. Archie Schaefer was one of them. Now with Tyson's, there were, uh, there were several others. Uh, there was strong movement to do that. Uh, it, 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 it got beat, it, it, went, it, it got defeated. I believe Jim Guy Tucker and David Pryor both raised issues of, during their governorships of, of a new constitution that, that, that didn't really go anywhere. So the short answer is, I would be very surprised, Connor, uh, if we would, if they would do that. And secondly, uh, being, uh, being a, 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 a top-notch student of law and public service, you might want to ask yourself the question in 2021, is that what we want to happen? Yes, point taken. <laughs> That's an interesting way to put it. Um, I'm gonna go on to the next message, which from, comes from Kristen Mann. Thank you, Kristen. What are the things you hope every Arkansas student un understands about our constitution? Uh, I think it's really important that's, that students under, understand how the three branches of government work, but also understand that their votes really matter, okay? So um, that it really, you know, people, I, I, have, I have family members who tell me this, who I vote for president doesn't make any difference. Yes, it does. I think I think we've really learned that over the last uh, probably 10 years or so that who we elect as president does make a difference. So understanding, I, I'd like Arkansas students to understand how each branch of the government functions and understand that the executive branch, the, the branch that the president has the authority over is the largest branch of the government. You know, you often ask students, what's the largest branch? And they go right for Congress because Congress has the most elected members. But the executive branch is much bigger and has much more authority and has a lot more discretion about how it does its business. And who's running that show, who is the president, makes a huge difference in how all of those agencies, what their priorities are and how they're run. Um, you know, so it's, I think it's really important that students understand how government functions, what each branch does, um, and that, that who they vote for makes a huge difference in how laws get enforced. Yeah, I agree with that, Kristen. That's a that's a good question. And you're, by the way, you're a great teacher, so you, we should be asking you that question and let you answer it. But I I think that um, that people need to have a better understanding of of at least the the high points of of the of the Constitution. I mean, nobody, very few people are going to be able to memorize in detail the. The, the, the 4,000 words of the Constitution and the 27 amendments that are in there. But I do think people need to know about, uh, as Dean Bonner said, the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments after the Civil War. I think people need to know about giving women the right to vote. And there was a great effort made to, uh, to highlight uh, that uh, um, uh, recognition. I think people need to know about and I remember it, you know, I remember it well when the 26th Amendment passed uh, in 1971, giving 18 year olds the right to vote. Uh, and I, I thought it was one of the greatest days uh, in the history of the country because that generation, my generation was going to Vietnam mm -hmm. uh, and, but we, but we couldn't vote. And it was a real uh, test. So I think people need to know the history a lot about the Constitution and how things uh, came about. So I've got another question. How resilient is the US Constitution in face of worsening public health crises and increasingly widespread and multifaceted climate emergencies such as fires, floods, and heat waves? Uh, Skip, what do you think? I think it's resilient. I think the Constitution is resilient. I think, uh, I think it is. Uh, there's a reason we've only had 17 amendments in uh, 230 years. Sometimes the, the politics of the persuasion at the time uh, does not 
make it to the document. So I think it's resilient. Well, it, you know, it is the second longest running constitution in the world. So uh, I think it, it's fairly resilient as well. I, I do think part of that is you know, that it's written in sufficiently vague terms that it can, it can adjust um, to changing times. Um, you know, I, I teach civil procedure and we talk about the due process clause and it, it shifts as modern transportation becomes a factor in how we do business. Um, and it's got to, otherwise, at a certain point, some of it, the interpretations, early interpretations just wouldn't make sense for a modern society. So um, I think the vague terms actually help it be somewhat resilient. Um, a lot of the crises that you're talking about are really it, are things that are going to be within the executive branch authority. And, you know, we're seeing that fight right now over this OSHA, um, you know, order uh, about these employers. Are, are we going to allow the executive branch to continue to, to to take on new crises as they arise uh, and give them enough discretion and leeway to do it, or is it gonna be reined in more by the courts? Um, so I'm, I'm gonna be very interested to see what happens with this. Position. I think there's one, there's a, another thing to watch on the state level, um, just to keep your eye on. One of the constitutional amendments that was, uh, one of the amendments that was uh, submitted and, 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 re and, and approved by the legislature, basically, uh, uh, says the legislature can call itself into session whenever it wants to um, or whatever it needs. And there's some safeguards. That's going to really change. If that passes, that's going to really change the balance. Arkansas already, I think, has a weak chief executive you know, overriding the veto of 5149 is all it takes. But if, if the legislature, uh, for example, um, you know, wants to do something on opposing vaccine mandates or passing a law like the Texas abortion law or whatever the issue may be, um, they can just call themselves into session. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's something to really, really watch because um, while Congress was set up as, as basically a full-time legislature, the state was not. Interesting. So um, Kristen's asking, what amendments, if any, do you think we might see proposed and ratified in the future, or might we ever have a new constitutional convention? I don't know if we'll have a new constitutional convention, but I'm always looking for the ERA to finally get ratified. Um, you know, it's it, it's had it's it's been it it, it got 38 votes. You need you need two thirds of the states. It, it got 38, but five states have pulled it back. So it's sort of in this constitutional quagmire right now. Uh, it also was supposed to be uh, ratified um, by in 1982 was the end, end date of ratifications. And some of those ratifications by states came after that. So um, its constitutional status is, mm, that doesn't seem to be, it seems to be somewhat in limbo, but I would really like to see the ERA finally get ratified. Skip, you got any thoughts on? Well, uh, where, uh, listen, uh, 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 as, as the father of two daughters, if I didn't say that I, I wanted the ERA ratified, I will get hate mail immediately after this call. But, but I, I think it does have a constitutional uh, problem. I think the fact that it didn't meet the deadline, it had five states rescind the vote. Uh, I think it, I think it, it does have a, a, a real uh, problem. But, but the question is, where is it in the process? I mean, you know, so we know it got 38 votes. We know five pulled back and we know one of them didn't get done until after the deadline. So where is it in the process? Is it to the Supreme Court? Is it in a district court or court of appeals? Or is it just out there? Um, you know, I don't know that off the, off the top of my head where it is right now. I, I, I seem to recollect that some court said that you know, it doesn't have the votes at this point because of the five rescinded. So it's, you know, back, it just doesn't have 38 anymore. Um, I know we've, it's been attempted to have it ratified in Arkansas. It has not, you know, Arkansas has not voted in favor of it yet, but, um, it, you know, it, it is definitely not, I would say that it's, it's, it's very problematic that it, it, at this point, to actually argue that it's ratified because of those five rescinded votes. So, I think one of the amendments that that, that that's, that's circulating out there that I, I don't know whether it'll go very far or not is the the, the proposal to abolish the electoral college mm -hmm. um, and to, to elect the president by popular vote. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I think that one is is in the mill trying to get enough states uh, to endorse that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one is in there. Yes, I don't. I, again, again, it's hard to know whether it will actually go anywhere. Probably won't. <laughs> yeah. So we got a question about: um, Do you think our schools are teaching the U.S. Constitution adequately? Skip, you got a thought on that? Well, I think they're doing better than they have. I think after Constitution Day, I think a lot of the civics classes do uh, do that. Colleges and universities are are focusing on it more. I think it's better, but uh, but again, I, I I'm of the belief, and this may be in a minority opinion. I think we've shortchanged civics and history and all that in our schools for a long time. I think we've we've pulled it back, and I understand the other side of. We need more co co courses for STEM and all that. I get that argument, but I just, I, I worry about the fact that many students can't even name their U.S. senators or their governor or mm -hmm. uh, uh, much less the, the branches of government. Um, so I, I, the answer is, I think the school, I think the teachers that are teaching the course are doing a good job. I think the problem is there's not enough emphasis at the national, state, and local level to make these courses a priority. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, you know, we sort of, um, you know, we teach civics, what, ninth grade, one, we have one year of civics that's required. Um, and I think it, it would be nice to see it beyond that. Um, I agree with Skip. I think that the teachers who are teaching civics to our high school students are dedicated teachers, but um, you know, it intersects all over the place. It intersects with history. It inter I mean, it, it just, uh, it intersects in a lot of areas of life. And I, and I think it's important that students realize um, where it intersects. Okay. So, you know, it I can agree come with you, all over the place. Mm -hmm. I agree with you because if you think about this, many of the voters uh, are many, well, are casting their first vote when they're a high school senior, mm -hmm. I mean they're still in high school. They're 18 years old, and they're 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 voting. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so I just I, I I think we need to do a better job there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's really important that students understand how the political system works, um, and and believe in the structure. Understand that the structure of government is designed for a purpose. Um, that's check check powers. We didn't talk about checks and balances, but it is it is set up for checks and balances so that no branch has too much authority and that it's checked by other branches. Um, and that means that sometimes things don't get done as well as as quickly or uh, in, as well as we'd like. Or there's a lot of compromise that has to occur um, for legislation to get passed. Um, and that's just the design of the thing. Um, nobody's ever going to get 100% their way. Um, so when you see these you know, I, I, I've been watching the news lately, really with a critical eye about how they're characterizing things, you know, so, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, we just passed a big uh, infrastructure act and it, you might think in some ways that the president had, a, it was bad for the president. And yet we, you know, if you know, understand how government works, you know, there's got to be compromises and people are going to have to give um, and you're not going to get everything you want. In any in most legislative acts, right? So, Dean Biner, the one of the more interesting, maybe maybe possibly, uh, certainly at the top, if not the top speaker uh, that we had during my tenure as dean was Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, though I must say that I, in fairness, we had uh, Brett Kavanaugh and others as well, but Ruth Bader Ginsburg was just, um, you know, almost iconic. Uh, but the question is, is that the average tenure of a Supreme Court justice is 16 years, and you pointed out things stay on for life, and she did. Mm -hmm. um, and she supposedly had told somebody she was waiting to give Hillary Clinton that appointment, since Bill Clinton had put her on the Supreme Court, that she was staying long enough to give Hillary Clinton the appointment. Well, the political process didn't work out that way. Hillary Clinton did not win. Uh, and Donald Trump got that appointment. So if the average tenure is 16 years, Justice Stephen Breyer has served 27 years. Uh, he is the 
23rd longest serving Supreme Court justice. In your opinion, should he retire? So, Skip, this is a very politically oriented this <laughs> question for me. <laughs> so, because you know, it makes a difference on who gets to, obviously makes a difference on who gets to appoint his replacement. Um, uh, you know, Breyer, of course, was um, uh, appointed by a Democratic president. Um, I would say, if he wants somebody who is similarly ideological to himself, he ought to step down now and allow President Biden to appoint his successor. And 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 in I mean and again that sort of makes the politics. I'm getting to the politics yeah. of the court. It's politics mm -hmm. because uh, that's how Neil Gorchis, when Kennedy stepped down, he let Trump have that appointment. Uh, and um, I'm not saying he should or he shouldn't. I don't know, but but it becomes very political in terms yeah. of of of, yeah. of 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 nominations and confirmations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the court, you know, the, the appointment process has, has been quite politicized. I mean, some folks say it goes back to, you know, Bork not being confirmed as a Supreme Court justice way back uh, in, in when President Reagan was in office. I, I think it's just, I, I don't know if that's the beginning of it. It certainly has gotten very politicized in recent, in recent yeah. years, um, because it does seem to tip the balance of power with the court having final say on constitutional issues. It's, um, it's, it, it, it's a major, you know, balance of power shift. And there's been a real effort by, um, you know, folks with poli a particular political, a particular political persuasions to, you know, manage court appointments to get their political outcomes um, from the court. So- Well, Ju um, Justice Breyer spoke here too. We had him speak and yeah. he's excellent. I mean, he's a very, I mean, certainly capable, qualified mm -hmm. jurist. There's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, again, I think you have to look at where you are. And by the way, it, 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 speaking of uh, Supreme Court history, uh, he was the one that edged out Richard Arnold for that appointment. Hmm. Interesting. J Judge Richard Arnold was, was, hmm. it, was, it was down to Breyer and Arnold hmm. uh, for that appointment by President Clinton. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a question in the chat. Um, asking if we can explain how the constitution is interpreted differently by different ideologies. What does originalism mean? If you believe in originalism, do you, well, so we go on for that. So um, originalism, so there's different philosophies, jurisprudential philosophies of how you look at um, the constitution. Originalism is you look at the original intent of the drafted constitution. Um, in answer to your question, um, uh, as far as, you know, uh, because the Constitution has is is racist in its foundations. It counted um, black black people as three quarter citizen, three quarter people for um, constitute for a congressional counting. Um, of course, that's all been changed by the thirteenth, fourteenth, and fifteenth amendments. Okay, so of course we we now acknowledge people um, of color. So that would have that that took an amendment to change that original thought. Okay, um, but originalism looks to the original intents and it, as well as to the original intents of amendments uh, to the Constitution. Um, so that's one way to look at it, and you look at the surrounding documentation and the, and the thoughts behind it. There's also textualism. So just looking at the text and just what does the text mean? And let's interpret based on plain text. Um, and then of course, there's folks who are more living constitutionalists that we have to adjust constitutional interpretation based on, based on changing times. And I'll tell you the truth, in my experience reading Supreme Court cases, uh, justice is sort of adjust their thinking depending on what, which one of these things is, are, is working for them. Um, it's not unusual, it, you know, we normally, um, associate um, living constitutionalism with sort of progressive judges, um, but you'll see, you know, occasional progressive judge using originalism where it suits their purposes. Um, so these are just forms of argumentation about how to interpret the constitution and judges use them when they suit their purposes, in my estimation. Um, anyway, so that, I, I don't skip if you have any thoughts on I that. I think that's right. I, 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 I think you were right on that. And, and I think, um, I think it's hard to I think it's hard to pigeonhole a liberal and a conservative mm -hmm. on that because I think they both go that way. I mean, at times, depending on yeah. their opinion at that time. So we have another question: Does the majority of Americans believe in the constitution? Believe in the constitution depend on who is 
commander in chief, or I'm not sure what you mean. Hi, Janice, what do you mean by this? <laughs> is he still on? Um, what I mean is um, mm -hmm. the, command, uh, the Americans talk about the constitution as being everything. Mm -hmm. And then when somebody is in office, the commander in chief can uh, talk about the constitution every time they, uh, they say something. And then the people, the American populace, uh, don't seem to really believe in that constitution because of the person who is sitting at that chair at that time. But somebody else is sitting there may be saying things that the ordinary person knows is not right, is not true. I can just use the constitution, twist it in the way it is going to favor the ideas or what I want to communicate. And then people immediately start almost, let me use the word drinking it as if they are just drinking coffee. Instead of saying, no, wait a minute. This is not the way the constitution is uh, or should be used or interpreted. And then it seems, and then another commander in chief comes and says something. It may be the same thing the other person said. And then there is some um, an explosion. Oh no, this person is not wrapping himself or herself with the flag. And mm -hmm. therefore, there is um, uh, as a, as a foreigner. It makes me feel, well, where do I stand? How much do I take this constitution really um, like a gospel truth that it is meant to be all along that I have been hearing it? That's, uh, uh, you know, my uh, poor uh, English is not my language, so I could not write it uh, as well as it should have yeah. been. <laughs> Thank you for the clarification, hygienist. Um, so you're talking about constitution of convenience. So we, yeah. we like yeah. the constitution when it supports our guy. We mm. don't like it when it doesn't support the other guy. <laughs> yeah, I think there's there's definitely out there in the political sphere um, the constitution for some folks. It's 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 a like you, like I said the constitution of convenience when it's when it helps us we're we're, we're touting the constitution. Uh, at, or one interpretation of it. When it hurts us, oh, suddenly that's not the right constitutional interpretation. And you, you see this happening. You see, you know, especially in politics, people flip-flopping on how they look at the constitution based on who is in the executive branch and what actions they're taking, whether they like those actions or not. So I can understand, uh, uh, Janice, I'm sensing a little cynicism in there. Um, and I, could, I can understand from the outside looking in that there is, it, it does seem like people, it's, it's, it's convenient uh, sometimes for them to like the constitution and other times to ignore what the constitution says when it doesn't suit their purposes. Skip, you got thoughts on that? No, I agree with that. I think that's exactly right. It, that, that makes it, uh, that is uh, the political side of, yep. of, 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 of the constitutional equation. I, th mm -hmm. I thought he defined it well. Yep, you have the politics uh, coming in there and people using it where it's convenient for them or ignoring it where it's it, where it's not helping them. Thank you for the clarification. Mm -hmm. You were spot on. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyone else have any questions that they would like to uh, pose to our guests? Excellent questions tonight, excellent presentation, discussion. Any other questions? Okay, well, um, bef before we say goodbye, I'd like to turn it over to Ann uh, Clements, who is our education uh, specialist at the Arkansas Humanities Council. And Ann, uh, I'd like for you to share with everyone some of our uh, upcoming events that they may want to tune in for. Well, our next uh, public lecture series will be the week of January 18th, or yeah, that week. We haven't quite got the date firmed up yet, but I can tell you that it will be a round table of judges from around the state consisting of Supreme Court judges, uh, US District Court judges, circuit judges, all moderated by Roby Brock of Talk Business and Politics. It promises to be another interesting uh, presentation and conversation. So 
as soon as we have that date confirmed, which will be before Thanksgiving, uh, we'll be sending out notices to everyone who attended tonight so you can register for that event as well. And what you're attending tonight is part of a three-part series that we're calling We the People. The public lecture series is one part of the series. The other two parts of the series are for teachers. And one of the questions related to, you know, how, do, how are we doing teaching civics and the structure of our constitution in schools? Well, this grant that we've received from the National Endowment from the Humanities is geared towards civic education. And so the second part of the series is a teacher seminar series, which provides uh, constitutional scholars coming in and talking to teachers and giving them points uh, about how to teach the constitution in our schools and things they need to do. And that's a nine part series. So if you have fifth through 12th grade uh, teachers that you know, please encourage them to uh, sign up for that teacher seminar series. And then the third part of the We the People, <clears throat> excuse me, series is an educational grant program, which is available for K through 12 teachers and librarians to uh, do classroom projects, professional development, uh, district-wide, school-wide projects that relate to the topics of our constitution and the rights that we have as citizens in America. So there's money available to teachers to use in their classrooms to help develop programs that they can teach in our classroom. And I just wanna give a shout out to Joe Key, our IHC board chair, and several of our board members are in this group. Uh, they are very committed to promoting civic education and have made it a priority of the board and of the Humanities Council. And we're thrilled to be focusing on that here at the council. So Skip, Terry, thank you so much for being a part of this conversation and starting us off on the right foot with this series. Yes, thank you both so very much, <laughs> Dean Biner and Dean Rutherford. We really do appreciate this uh, incredible discussion that you've shared with us tonight. And thank to, thanks to all of you for joining us this evening and for your questions. It's so good to see so many familiar faces um, and names. And again, uh, our honored guests, thank you both so very, very much for this evening. We really appreciate your time and your, your sharing with us. And I hope all of you have a wonderful evening and a wonderful Thanksgiving next week. And I do hope that you, all of you will be able to join us in the coming weeks as we continue with the We the People People, people um, series. Uh, and so thank you so much and have a wonderful evening. And again, thank you to our guests. We really appreciate you very Our much. pleasure. Thank you for the Thank invitation. you all. Thank Enjoyed you. It. Thank you for coming. Thank Good night, you. everyone.